Hey folks, it's Riker here. Oh, <coughs> oh, sorry, sorry. Stole Riker's hat. It just like, it infects you. It kind of, it gets into you. No, but more seriously, we're looking at the sacrilegious ring that's coming in season two. In fact, it's going to be dropping tomorrow. So by the time I get this video out, you'll already be able to start farming it. It's going to drop from Varshan, the effectively like the first part of the ladder boss that we've already been farming. So if you haven't already, go do a ton of whispers, save up all your mats, and you probably want to be farming it on world tier four, because one, I'm not sure if it drops on world tier three, if I'm going to be honest with you, but two, you definitely want to get to be the highest item power that you possibly can, since we do care about the resistance rolls on this ring. But to give you a quick breakdown of what I'm going to do in this video, I've gone through all of my build guides and I've created a sacrilegious variant of it. This is the best way that I think that you can incorporate the ring into all the various builds that I write on max roll. And obviously I'm going to be testing them all out once I have the ring in hand. But for people who haven't seen it before, but for people who haven't seen it before, this was effectively the best malignant heart of Ability from season one. It was called the Sacrilegious Heart, and it made a very simple gameplay loop into something that was completely automated. If you had Ray Skeleton, Corpse Explosion, or Corpse Tendrils on your skill bar and the heart equipped, it would, according to its internal timer, cast those skills randomly for you. So it had a six second cooldown for corpse tendrils. It's a little bit different here. It's actually an eight second cooldown on a perfect roll. And then it had a one second cooldown for corpse explosion and a one second cooldown for raised skeleton. So if you have all of your skeletons summoned, it doesn't do anything, but if any of them die, it automatically targets a corpse and casts it for you. If there are corpses around in general, it will continuously spam corpse explosion. And then again, once every six seconds, it'll cast corpse tendrils. Now, the cool part about this is that this occurs without interrupting your own cooldowns or your own internal cooldowns. So it can cast corpse tendrils and you can cast corpse tendrils effectively doubling your total output of corpse tendrils, effectively adding like another 33% corpse explosions, depending on your attack speed, and basically meaning that you never need to manually recast your skeletons unless you're looking to buff them with the skeletal priest ability. So obviously it's incredibly powerful, and not only that, it just makes a lot of gameplay loops very seamless and allows you to add on a corpse consumption package to builds that otherwise wouldn't want to spend the actions per minute or APM to be able to do it themselves. If you're using Howl from Below, when it casts Corpse Explosion, it uses Howl from Below's Corpse Explosion as opposed to just a normal one. So it actually send the running spirit off to go explode against a target that it uh, runs towards. And then on top of that, if you're using Black River, it will attempt to consume multiple corpses simultaneously and give it the damage boost. So it's not like you ever get cheated out of effects from your gear. It casts these skills as if you did. So lastly, on top of that, if it casts corpse tendrils for you, you gain the benefits of grasping veins. So not only does it automate gameplay, but maintain a ton of buffs for you and also benefit from all of your gear, but it allows you to do things that you otherwise normally wouldn't be able to. Before we actually get into the builds themselves, I need to explain just how disgustingly powerful this ring is, because it's not just the fact that has really good stats, like affixes that you would want, and it's not just the fact that it's a ring that says plus three to corpse skills, an affix that you could never get on a ring before and you could only get on an amulet, but if you take a quick look at the stats of this ring a little bit more deeply, you might notice something out of the ordinary and maybe just looking at the base ring isn't good enough. So let's go ahead and look at another example of a similar ring that you would get at this item power. The resistance rolls, the lucky hit rolls, the maximum life rolls and the maximum essence rolls on this ring are all higher than they can typically be. So ignore the last two things, which is the unique aspect as well as the corpse skills. The ring is literally stronger than any comparative ring that you would get with these stats on it. So you will literally have more resistance, more lucky hit chance, more maximum life and more maximum essence. Maybe that's not quite concrete enough. So let me go ahead and show you what the difference is between these stats and a base ring. The resistance rolls are 1.69 nice times higher than they normally are. The lucky hit roll is 2.25, so 225% of the normal value that you would get. Life is 1.68 times as high, and the maximum essence is 1.55 times as high. Looking at the final rolls on this piece of gear, you will have 20 lucky hit chance, as opposed to a whopping 9 lucky hit chance that you used to be able to get on a base ring. You'll have 
20 all resistance, as well as 20 poison resistance, which again is nowhere near the maximum roll that you could typically get. You'll have 2200 maximum life on this ring, which is only about 800 life higher than the biggest maximum roll of 1310 that you can normally get. Oh, and again, it just has plus four ranks to all corpse skills, meaning corpse explosion gains four ranks and corpse tendrils gains four ranks. That means that if you were to put together the four from this ring from corpse explosion, the four from Black River, so that's eight, the four from Shaco, so that's 12, the four from your pants, so that's 16, the three from your amulet, that's 19, and then the five base skill ranks, you can reach a skill rank of 24 on Corpse Explosion, putting it well over 300% damage coefficient, an absolutely bananas number. So what I have for you is timestamps down below to each build, and I'm gonna try to very quickly go over how I think the ring slots in, why I think it's important, and whether or not I think it's a best in slot, version of that build or something that you may need to understand be able to pilot it yourself to start doing your own theory crafting and your own testing because we're all going to gain access to these rings at the same time roughly so it's it's going to be a little bit wild west while everybody kind of waits for the dust to settle to figure out how effective these rings are on various builds sever wants to do a lot of crit damage it wants to do a lot of direct damage it needs an essence generator here so we're using exposed flesh and it turns out that using Sacrilegious Soul helps to automate a little bit to maintain a lot of buffs that we care about on the build. Sever starves for the ability to actually get a high critical strike chance. So being able to have corpse tendrils up effectively all of the time means that we just gain an additional 20% chance to crit. And then on top of that, since we're already using Decrepify for reducing cooldowns, the constant corpse explosions while we're casting Sever the entire time helps to maintain a huge amount of AOE damage and lucky hit procs to be able to reduce the cooldown on Bone Storm and Blood Mist so that we can more easily rely on the survivability here and have greater uptime on Bone Storm, getting us more uptime on crit chance as well as survivability from the damage reduction and barrier generation. But just to point out a little bit more why it is so powerful, if I am perpetually spamming my sever, I'm going to be using a lot of essence. And if the ring is casting corpse explosion once every second, even if I only have two points in here, I'm gaining an additional four essence generation per second that I wouldn't normally have. So that bumps you up to around like seven to eight essence regen every single second. And if you really wanted to, you could very easily take an additional point out of anywhere probably most notably terror and then bump this up to six so now we're getting close to like 10 essence per second outside of generation from exposed flesh then on top of that the lucky hit chance on the ring goes a long way to be able to bump up sever's really low lucky hit chance so you can more easily rely on being able to proc exposed flesh as well as being able to proc decrepify and then the maximum life is huge for survivability the maximum essence means we actually just get to cast one more free sever per essence globe so it's like you just gained an additional cast in your normal rotation without having to worry about any other essence generation. And then on top of that, Corpse Explosion does do a good amount of our damage. And then again, the ranks to Corpse Tendrils is going to lower its cooldown even further. So it's obviously a great include here. It helps to maintain permanent uptime on Fueled by Death. The other great part is that it's going to be eating corpses as you're running away from combat. And this is something I'm going to bring up for the majority of the builds, since it is something that you can rely on as long as you are using Grim Harvest. And then it obviously also helps to maintain a near permanent uptime on the Flesh Eater bonus, one of the biggest multipliers you can get on just about any build for the very low amount of Paragon board investment that it takes to get here. Since just about everybody is running Flesh Eater board because of how good of a glyph socket it is with the rare nodes that it has around it. Infinimist is probably where this ring fits in the easiest. It's just an absolute powerhouse for the build. There's no question here. It is an auto include. I think it's definitely best in slot and it begs a very important question and I basically should make a whole video about it, but I actually have two setups that I need to show you here. So this is going to be our base Infinimist build. We're still using a wand. We're looking to proc lucky hit all the time because we're really looking to pump out a huge amount of damage from x falls this just has a ridiculous amount of lucky hit chance for us it has more corpse explosions going more of the time so that we're able to have more lucky hit procs going simultaneously and then on top of that again with the corpse tendrils casting more often than we were previously 
It helps us to blood mist into a pack. Since it will auto cast corpse tendrils for us, it means by the time we come out of our blood mist, monsters are already grouped up, already have vulnerable applied, and are already taking a ton of AoE damage. So this just really helps to grease the wheels and make sure that the engine is never stalling out on the build. But I already hear you, Mac, an additional four ranks to corpse explosion. You were just going on about how powerful that is. Promise me you're not being a super holdout and tell me a little bit of Black River. Well, I promise. I got you, boo-boo. Of course I got you. I, it just goes to show, like, I got nothing against this item. I truly don't. I just don't think that it was optimal on the base Infinimus. That's it. Like, that's it. I promise you. I don't have it out for this item. But let's go ahead and talk about it, because I do think that you need to optimize pretty strongly to be able to make up for some of the inherent problems that I think comes along with Black River. And it also comes along a little bit with a gameplay style change up here. Now, this build is absolutely nutty, like I'm also trying to show how powerful it would be with the Shaco here. In fact, the interesting part is this build is now looking to prioritize so much more corpse damage that I'm even running Exhumation, the additional corpse damage glyph, just to show you I'm all in. I'm trying to help out here. This is what I think you should do with Black River. The first most important thing is that I think that you're gonna need Lucky Hit with Barrier on your amulet, as opposed to additional ranks in Gloom. Now, I would probably still want ranks in Gloom over ranks to corpse skills, but like I told you, I'm trying to go all in here. I'm trying to meet you halfway. I'm still gonna use my X Falls, but I'm trying to show you what you can do with maximum ranks to corpse skill damage so that the corpse explosion is right there along with the X Falls. Like they're going hand in hand and they're both going as hammer as possible here. The other big change here is swapping over permanently to the Greaves of the Empty Tomb. This has two parts to it. Obviously the lucky hit chance is phenomenal, we love that, but the damage reduction to shadowed targets I think becomes a lot more important because on this version of the build with Black River, regardless of our ability to generate corpses, you literally need multiple corpses on the ground before you can really start benefiting from Black River at all. Because if you only have one corpse, you literally don't get a damage multiplier from its aspect. That means that we need to be standing around reaping more often. We need to be playing a bit more with bone storm uptime and staying next to monsters to have as many corpses generated. So that when we do drop the mega nuke of corpse explosion with Black River and all of our plus to ranks, we're getting the most out of it that we possibly can. Interestingly enough, you'll notice that I've dropped Howl from below. Now, this one is going to be probably like the most debated choice here and i think people are going to come down in two camps i personally believe that dropping blood soaked from the build is so detrimental to its overall efficiency that there's no point in playing it in this way people vastly underestimate how powerful it is to be able to use blood mist as a mobility skill and to be able to apply an additional shadow damage over time dot that not only is adding up our Shadow Blight, that's also adding up our Blighted Aspect, but is proccing X-Falls for us in real time, so that as we are maneuvering through targets, we're already outputting a ton of damage. Now, some people don't care about that, and honestly, their argument for why they wouldn't use Blood Soaked is going to be exacerbated by the fact that I'm no longer using Ghost Walkers on the build. This is one of the issues that I have with the build in general when you try to incorporate Black River is you start making these weird allowances for inefficiencies to get into it, but, but you're going to get a metric ton of damage out of it, and I can't deny that there is an efficiency gain there. Now, while I currently have Shaco on the build, and you are going to get that cooldown reduction, so you're going to be able to maintain the Infinimist engine more easily this way, you're losing out on 15% barrier lucky hit chance, and I think that is too important to give up on. But the interesting part is that you'll also notice that Explosive Mist used to be on my helmet. I don't have it anywhere else on the build because I think that Explosive Mist is actually counter synergistic with the Ring constantly casting Corpse Explosion and Black River triggering off of that eating multiple corpses. I think that Explosive Mist with the new Sacrilegious Ring will literally be too many instances of corpse consumption effects and you're basically never going to have multiple corpses on the ground. So we're removing that from the build. It does mean that you can put another defensive slot on if you still want to use a helmet that has the lucky hit chance. Just make sure that the engine doesn't stall out as often as possible. But there's like a lot there, right? There, I just threw a lot of things at you. But this build will be here. All of these will be in my Discord. I'll have everything linked below, etc. But this will be here for people who go, damn it, Mac, teach me how to do it with Black River. Here's the option. Here's the best way that I think that you can go about doing it. The only other thing that I really want to note 
is that your vampiric powers kind of change a bit here. Because you need to do a bit more setup with Black River, and the ring is going to be casting corpse tendrils every eight seconds for you on top of yours, you're actually going to be staggering bosses much faster than you would have previously on a Black River setup. So what's interesting about that is that we do have a little bit of a swap depending on whether or not you are staggering a boss or you're not staggering a boss. Obviously still flowing veins, you'll need to be able to apply Vampiric Curse by dashing through a target here. Metamorphosis to be able to do that. Domination, just for when we are fighting normal monsters, we get that damage multiplier. And when we stagger bosses, we'll get that damage multiplier as well. Prayer in the Week for the additional vulnerable. And then Terror here. The interesting part about Terror is that this is only for bosses. This is basically never going to trigger on any base monster. So instead of that, I would highly recommend either Anticipation, just because it's so good, obviously. Resilience for additional damage reduction, because I do think you're going to be out of blood mist, kind of reaping a lot more than you normally would to get enough corpses to be able to instant pop a pack. And then kind of to that same idea, either undying just for healing as opposed to the damage reduction. This says if you're dying more, you slow down how fast you're dying, but it requires that you're constantly taking damage. This says offset that damage by healing yourself. So it's kind of interesting. You can kind of swap these two in and out. And then if you really want to be a little bit cheeky, you could throw on Sanguine Brace just to be able to fortify on the build just have that kind of ineffective and inefficient application of 10% damage reduction but also gaining the additional crit chance so that even when you don't have bone storm up or the grasping veins effect in play when you're fighting typical monsters or even against a boss before you stagger you can still be critting with x falls so there you go there's a lot of interplay in this version of the build i wanted to load it up closer to the front of the video because i know a lot of people are going to be looking for it but also i just had so much to go through so in, in case you're looking for some of the other builds you can kind of skip this little section but there you go that's all the thoughts that i've had about this ring and infinimist i'm positive i'll be having more once we test more but let's move on to the next build blood surge and blood lance talking about blood surge right now really need to ask an interesting question and it is how valuable is maximum life super valuable lucky hit chance also super valuable but realistically better uptime on corpse tendrils Corpse Tendrils is an amazingly powerful tool for the build because on both Blood Lance and Blood Surge, you want monsters crowd controlled and in one area so that all of your AoE damage and all of your piercing damage are as effective as possible. So not only does the ring give you a huge amount of lucky hit chance, which Blood Surge desperately needs and allows you to proc more abilities than you normally would, the maximum life goes a long way to be able to offset the fact that you need to drop your shield to actually maintain a single resource aspect as well as all of the offensive aspects that you need. So losing the life from the shield is offset by the ring, but then the maximum essence similar to sever basically means you get like one more free cast of blood surge per globe, but it's really the fact that it automates corpse tendrils when you blood mist into a pack that makes it so that this ring has a value for you at all because you'll notice that i didn't put corpse explosion on the build it's not powerful enough to be able to benefit from that i'm not going to go for flesh eater in the paragon board either too many points to invest over to it and again we're not going to use corpse explosion it's not powerful enough but what it allows you to do and i'll basically try to explain the gameplay loop you're going to walk up to a bunch of monsters and hopefully Blood surging through an entire globe will just kill them. And you're going to do just that. You're going to blood surge, blood surge, blood surge. This is going to kill some of the monsters. It's going to drop some corpses so you can manually cast corpse tendrils. The reason why that's so powerful is, oddly enough, when you corpse tendrils, a pack of five monsters, you get three triggers of five times your umbral. So there I would generate 60 essence effectively for free. And then on top of that, if it wasn't enough, as I blood mist through my targets, which creates a corpse, the ring will auto cast corpse tendrils and I'll get that effect a second time. So your ability to manually cast it and then the ring's ability to auto cast it means that every fight you basically get to walk in completely topped off and that's without using any other resource gen shenanigans. And then again, since all blood builds now want to benefit from having grasping veins on their kit, having a more permanent uptime on that 20% crit chance means that you are effectively in the 80% crit chance near 100% of the time. I know there's a lot of numbers, but also the damage multiplier goes a long way so that if that one elite is left over at the end, your corpse tendrils comes in, deals damage, you get that multiplier and you're able to finish them off more easily. On top of that, monsters just being corpse tendrils for twice as long per fight, you can more easily rely on just hemorrhaging for additional essence so that you can get another full orb of casts in to be able to benefit from overpowering multiple times over. 
overpowering, then reset your Blood Mist. So it fits into the gameplay in a much more naturalistic way and allows you to rely on more survivability, more uptime of damage, and less requirements on resource generation. Okay, again, everything that I just said for Blood Surge kind of applies to Blood Lance, but we're talking about different aspects here. So you'll notice that I'm continuing to use Potent Blood as opposed to Hungry Blood. I used to have Hungry Blood down here on the base setup. You have Potent Blood and Rathmus Chosen up here. And I kind of think that the choice between Potent Blood for Essence Maintenance or Hungry Blood for Blood Lance Propagation comes down to whichever one makes a more clean and consistent gameplay loop. And I think it also a little bit depends on what you're doing. So if you're running in Nightmare Dungeons, being able to rely on gore quills to generate blood orbs from your like consistent output of corpse tendrils, again, especially from the ring itself, means that potent blood should make it so that you have infinite essence as long as you are actively fighting monsters. That being said, in wider open areas and hell tides and outdoor content, not having hungry blood does mean we're literally just shooting out less blood lances to less targets simultaneously, so our damage isn't spreading as far. In a nightmare dungeon or in like high density fighting combat scenarios or even against like a single target boss, you don't need more than gore quills automating picking up the blood orbs for you. But the moment that you're trying to fight monsters or cry to, across a wider range and you're not able to just stack them all into one place with corpse tendrils, hungry blood becomes infinitely more important. So this one is kind of up to interpretation. It's a little bit up to your own type of sauce. But again, we're benefiting so much from being able to blood mist into a pack. And the moment that we come out of that, there are already corpse tendrils. So we can start laying down our damage, being able to apply twice as many corpse tendrils, having near permanent uptime of that 20% crit chance, as well as additional 40% crit multiplier damage, just vastly overperforms anything else that you would have in this slot. But we'll have to see which one of these two aspects ends up making the final cut. And again, I think it's mostly related to what content you're doing at what time. Shadow Surfer build here, the one that's trying to do ultimate shadow blood wave as often as possible, along with Tidal, was an interesting build to try to figure out whether or not I think it's incredibly valuable. I ended up coming down on the side of I might as well just give you a reference point and then you decide whether or not you like it yourself. Basically, what we would have been using here before this is Fast Blood. Fast Blood says when you pick up a Blood Orb, you're going to reduce your cooldown. It just turns out that you don't really need this once you have Flicker Step. So I am talking about the endgame version of the build. We're using a two-hander with Ultimate Shadow and Flicker Step to be able to reduce its cooldown. Basically, all we care about is evading as often as possible. So we need as much attack speed as possible. And then we just keep laying down these massive, massive blood waves. But again, just looking at the base stats on the ring, it does help to be able to cast Corp Tendrils more often and be able to put out some additional damage from Corpse Explosion itself. Because basically what you do is you rotate between casting Corpse Explosion twice and then evading through the monster, casting Blood Wave, evading through the monster, casting Corpse Explosion twice, or weaving in Blight. Blight so you can get additional lucky hit procs on X Falls on top of the fact that it gives you the 1.15 damage multiplier when a monster is sitting inside of the Blight's area of effect. So if you run out of essence, you need to corpse explode. If you have essence, you cast Blight and so on and so forth until the monster is dead. So just the corpse explosion itself doing a bit more damage helps. It's 44% more damage. I don't think that it's necessarily an auto include. The lucky hit chance does mean that X falls procs a bit more, which is obviously good. We want that additional crit proccing damage, but it just turns out that ultimate shadow itself on blood wave does like such nutty amounts of damage over time that these two rings are just kind of nice to have. I'm absolutely willing to find out that it's just like completely like, like disgusting levels of broken on just about every single darkness build, which is kind of what I'm expecting. But I definitely think that it's going to perform its worst here on Shadow Surfer. Now, here's the interesting part, though. If you're going to run this ring and you're not going to run Fast Blood, it means that you don't want to run Blighted Corpse Tendrils for Blood Orbs, so you get to apply Vulnerable without having to dash through a target. And we don't care about Supreme Blood Wave generating Blood Orbs. So you actually get to regain a point here. You can put it back into Terror. If you really want to, you just get an additional damage multiplier there. You can pump it somewhere else into the build. So like a little bit more cooldown on Blood Mist, a little bit more cooldown on Corpse Tendrils. 
but it's kind of interesting to note like you just you don't need this part of it anymore now that being said you can still leave it in if you liked relying on the blood orbs for a little bit of additional healing but just remember it's not going to touch your cooldown on blood wave anymore and it basically means you are forced to have flicker step to play with this ring and then on top of that you need to be playing at like a really high apm to be getting the most out of the boots so you're never losing out on some efficiency gain that you would have had from just running fast blood itself bone spirit the build that is looking to manually cast bone spirit ends up in a very similar place as the blood builds it just turns out that being able to have a near permanent uptime on corpse tendrils means that you get to rely on having 100 crit up as often as possible having the crit damage multipliers up as often as possible especially against bosses in case you don't one shot them but on top of that it asks a very interesting question which is how do you benefit the most from this ring one the maximum essence being a higher role means that it is going to be the biggest total multiplier to bone spirits base multiplier itself serration aspect is going to be stronger for you uh, the ability to gain crit from your skill tree is obviously going to be stronger as well and then obviously ossified essence is also going to be stronger because of this so it actually does fit in quite well with all bone builds just because the maximum essence roll is as high as physically possible but then it made me really go and look at the vampiric powers that you use on bone spirit which i guess i just hadn't looked at in a little bit because it turns out it's a pretty unpopular build and it's kind of hard to optimize it beyond just nuking one monster over and over and over again but similar to everything on the blood builds it just means you get to join into the fight with blood mist already going the ring will cast the corpse tendrils the corpse tendrils will refill your essence so that you don't have to worry about trying to generate your own essence from bone spirit as often and you can effectively cast it twice per fight as opposed to once per fight and then try to wrangle up monsters to get another big explosion going after that. But let's talk about the vampiric powers. I don't think that's immediately obvious what you should be running. One, metamorphosis, obviously. Two, sanguine brace, just in case you need the crit chance. This is a way of gaining the additional crit chance. Prayer in the week, because we're applying vulnerable, so we might as well get an additional multiplier. Here, Anticipation, just because it is nice to be able to cast Bone Storm more often. Turns out that Bone Spirit is just a terrible lucky hit mechanic, so it doesn't proc Decrepify a whole bunch. We still benefit from Decrepify, don't get it wrong. And Bone Storm itself can even proc the Decrepify to reduce its own cooldown. But Anticipation does help. But you'll notice I'm running Resilience. Resilience just says as we lose life, we gain the damage reduction. We've talked about this. But I want to talk about Blood Boil. Very specifically Blood Boil. Now you may think this is completely ridiculous, but Blood Boil sure does say that if I'm running to the boss at the end of a Nightmare Dungeon, the first time that I cast Bone Spirit on it, I'm going to overpower, which obviously gets it a minimum 1.5 damage multiplier. If you look at my build right now, we have about 475 overpower damage, just because that's how much we end up with with all of our maximum life, etc. And just gaining an additional 400% additive damage onto your attack that you're trying to one-shot bosses with, pretty, pretty nice, I would say. In general, pretty nice. And since we can have 100% chance to crit, you could also be running Banish Lord's Talisman. So you could be running Banish Lord's Talisman that says that you're going to get a 2.2 damage multiplier when you crit and you overpower, and then you are always going to overpower with the blood boil, bare minimum, and you can get the automatic overpower from the vampiric power, and then this thing says when you overpower, so you can just choose to have an additional 2.2 damage multiplier on top of your 1.5 damage multiplier, on top of your near 500 additional additive damage. And then the last build that we're looking at is not a build guide that I currently have on Max Roll. Echo Hack currently writes the Bone Spear Necromancer build guide, but since I was going through every other build, I figured I would also show people how I would be running Bone Spear this season. I have not run it yet, so it's liable to change based on my experience, but I wanted to give a little bit of guidance in case you were wondering how you could fit this into the build and how you can benefit from it most easily. And basically what it turns out is that the ring, while it's not like crazy strong for the build, it does have maximum essence. It does have maximum life. We do like the lucky hit chance since we are relying on lucky hit from exposed flesh, as well as lucky hit on our gloves to be able to basically perpetually generate essence for us. What it really does is invests back into the corpse consumption engine without needing to do it manually yourself. Something that the Bone Spray Necromancer got to benefit from 
in season one by running the sacrilegious heart. So we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're just making sure that it all works in season two. So you'll notice that. So you'll notice that I literally just have one rank into corpse explosion. I have three ranks into grim harvest and then three ranks into fueled by death. The way that we get there is by removing the decrepify package. I really like the Decrepify package on Bone Spear, just being able to like apply crowd controlled status to a pack of monsters before they come near me. Good survivability, etc. This is trying to create the infinite running gun, never need to stop, just do the most damage possible version of the build. So as you initiate on a fight, the ring is going to be eating corpses for you, getting back essence. So if you somehow fail to hit expose flesh or from the chance to restore essence here, it means that as you're literally running by, you'll be regaining your full globe. You'll be maintaining a permanent uptime on Fueled by Death itself. On top of that, you will have better uptime on Corpse Tendrils, so you can rely on that crit chance more easily, even if it's just casting and not hitting a single target. It also means that there's like the vague chance of you being able to stagger a boss in case, I don't know, some like something in some content is actually living long enough for you to run out of Bone Spears, being able to cast auto cast corpse tendrils here and then being able to manually cast it just means that you have like that permanent uptime on the buffs that we've already talked about a whole bunch and then it also means that you're heavily incentivized to be able to build into the flesh eater node here so as you're moving through combat by the time you get to the next fight you're gonna have this 1.4 multiplier on top of the 1.09 from your skill tree and then you're gonna be able to output a ton more damage if monsters are surviving auto casting corpse tendrils here again allows you to rely on blood misting into a pack for control so you can come out the other side and then rain bone spears back into them it just kind of naturally fits with the flow of the build. And then on top of that, using Tobalt's Will for the additional damage and then the additional resource gain basically means that this build has effectively automated everything you need it to. And all you got to do is hold down the trigger and cast Bone Spear as often as possible. I have build planners to everything down below. I'm going to have links to everything down below. It's all in my Discord as well. You can all go find it there. I'll be updating that as I'm editing this video and sending it out to YouTube. But those are all the different builds that I currently have a hand in or I need to update myself in the ways that I think that this absolutely bananas ring is going to fit in the meta of builds. I don't think it goes on every single thing and I don't think that it's min-maxed for every single thing. But what it does do is automate so much of the gameplay loop for necromancers that you can get back to enjoying the parts that you personally like as opposed to managing resources, making sure that you're casting corpse explosion to maintain uptime on buffs, etc, etc. Just things that lost you so much economy of action that they weren't typically worth it for you to do in your build itself, or even if it was worth it to do in your build, you just get this little bit of additional umph. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you had any questions, any suggestions, you think there's a better way of doing it, please let me know down in the comments. I would love to hear from you. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. We're going to have so much content coming out with all of the new gameplay types that are going to be in Season 2, the two different things, the Midwinter Blight and the Abattoir of Zir all the theory crafting that we're going to need to do for that, all the grinding we're going to be doing to try to get enough Ubers so that we're like, we're prepared for all of that. So subscribe to the channel if you're excited about that. Go ahead and leave a like on the video as well. It helps me out so much and I'm deeply appreciative for it. But as always, I truly hope that this video helped and I look forward to seeing you in the next one.